How much more can Ukrainians take the race to avert humanitarian disaster after the Kharkovka dam collapse? With floodwaters rising, thousands are evacuated, yet more refugees in their own land. As drones fly in fresh drinking water, Ukraine and Russia blame each other for sabotage. This act of terror resulted in a breach of the Kachovka Reservoir, unleashing a torrent of water down the Dnipro River. There is a torrent of questions too, not least what this means for Ukraine's counter-offensive. We'll get the latest from Emma, who's there, also on News at 10 tonight. It's been a lot. An emotional Prince Harry as he finishes his hacking trial evidence in court. Sunak stateside, the PM to meet President Biden tomorrow, but what exactly will he get out of it? Anushka's there. A dire smog warning across America's northeast and Canada from hundreds of wildfires. None of this is coincidence. This smoke and fog over New York and the rest of the northeast is a warning from nature. And what lies beneath Berkshire, the carved wood 2,000 years older than Stonehenge. This is ITV News at 10 with Julie Etchingham. Good evening to all the horrors Ukraine's southern region of Kherson has already endured since war broke out. Fresh disaster has now been added. The sheer devastation of lands and livelihoods brought on by the destruction of the Noga Kavkovka Dam. Quite what caused its breach remains unclear. Ukraine points the finger firmly at the reservoir's Russian occupiers, their latest war crime in official claim today. But the Russians say it was Ukrainian sabotage designed to distract from Kyiv's long-awaited counter-offensive. Either way, if, as all evidence suggests, it was entirely man-made, it is all too easy to lose sight of that. The damage so bad and so widespread, it is akin to a natural disaster rather than simply another tragic theatre of this unnatural war. Ukraine's battlefield has changed once more. The sustaining water of life unleashed, taking land and life. For thousands, the only way to avoid drowning was to seek safety as high up as possible and hope. In this war waged so often with drones, today they were deployed to save life, not take it. Delivering of all things, water, to those trapped by the rising levels. 17,000 people are being moved, displaced in their own land. 40,000 could be at risk. It is a monumental operation and not without significant risk in water which contains mines. I kept sitting, hoping I could stay, but then the water ran with such force that my son took a boat from a neighbour and we got out, this woman says. These people lived under Russian occupation. They celebrated liberation. Now they are fleeing for their lives once more. Even in flight from this new threat, the old one remains shells falling as the land is inundated. The Russians probably knocked out the dam without thinking, he says. They're inhumane. They have no forgiveness. Absolutely none. After 16 months of battle, refuge in basements and shelters used to offer some safety. For those in the water's path, even those places of safety are gone now. The walls of the dam once offered protection, but protection is a rare commodity in this country. Ukraine's president has described the horror of the Novokakovka Dam as an environmental bomb of mass destruction. His government publicly accusing Russia of blowing the walls out, whilst Russia levels the same accusation at Ukraine. Russian forces detonated the dam and machinery hall of the Kakhovka hydroelectric power station. This act of terror resulted in a breach of the Kachovka Reservoir, unleashing a torrent of water down the Dnipro River. What looks like a natural disaster is in fact a very unnatural one, inflicted by man on an already war-wearied population. Emma Murphy, News at 10, 
Ukraine. Well, beyond the immediate and obvious effect of the flooding, there are fears for the longer-term impact of the dam's collapse. Geraint has been looking at the cost and the wider consequences, and they're considerable indeed, Geraint. Yeah, Julie, I've started with a look at the map, where until yesterday morning, the Kharkovka Dam stretched across the mighty Dnipro River around 25 miles east of the city of Kherson in Russian-controlled southern Ukraine. It was built in the 1950s and held back an enormous reservoir of water and it formed part of a hydroelectric power plant. Water from the reservoir supplies the Crimean Peninsula, which was annexed by Russia in 2014, and further upstream, the Zaporizhia nuclear power station, the largest in Europe. Now, we've already seen some of the catastrophic effects of the destruction of the dam. Have a look at these before and after satellite images. But Ukrainian officials say that as many as 80 towns and villages across an area of nearly 1,000 square miles between the dam and the Black Sea coast are still at risk of flooding and hundreds of thousands of people face losing their normal access to drinking water. Now, Ukraine is usually a globally significant producer and exporter of grain. But its agriculture ministry warns that the loss of the dam will leave half a million hectares of land, an area about the size of Devon, without irrigation, turning fields into deserts by this time next year. The price of wheat has already jumped, and there are also worries about the cooling mechanism at that nuclear plant, which also relies on water from the reservoir. Now, the flood water flows, of course, as the Ukrainian military prepares for its counteroffensive and its attempt to take back the land in southern Ukraine that it has lost to the invaders. And what battle plans it did have, Julie, might have to be very quickly redrawn. OK, Geraint, thank you for all the detail on that. And we can pick up that point with Emma, who's in Kyiv tonight. And talking about that counteroffensive, how might this impact Ukraine's attack when it eventually comes, Emma? Well, I think it certainly complicates the situation for Ukraine. They've been planning this counteroffensive for really quite some time now. And there's no doubt that that area near Kherson would have been absolutely critical to it. They would have hoped that there was a possibility they could have got across the uh, Dnipro River in also potentially using the dam as some kind of road access. But that is now a completely lost hope. So I think, you know, here in Kyiv tonight, they are reassessing what they're going to do, which particular areas of the front line they're going to concentrate on. Um, President Zelensky has been speaking at length today about the situation in the country, particularly about the situation at the dam. And he was saying that uh, some of those who've been trying to carry out rescues are coming under attack, being shot at by uh, Russian troops on the, the left bank. They've also been trying to help those citizens who are trapped in that occupied territory. They haven't been able to, and there doesn't appear to be any Russian attempts to help those people there. So I think tonight, not only are they dealing with this humanitarian crisis, they're also dealing with a military crisis as they try and assess just how they move forward with this critical counteroffensive. OK, Emma, thank you very much indeed. Now, after what had been, if you were to believe, certain sections of the press, a rather flustered first day in court, Prince Harry returned today to finish giving his evidence against the Mirror Group. Generally, he appeared more confident, more composed, as he was taken through articles he alleges were the result of unlawful information gathering. But asked at the end of his cross-examination about the impact of the last two days, he became emotional. It has been, he said, a lot. A royal at the royal courts of justice, so rare, Prince Harry wants to make this count. A brief acknowledgement of the many waiting cameras. Harry! Harry! Eight hours in the witness box to convey 15 years worth of alleged frenzied and criminal activity by Mirror Group newspapers. He was asked if the court were to find that you were never hacked by any MGN journalists, would this be a relief or disappointment? The Duke of Sussex replied, I believe that phone hacking was on an industrial scale across at least three of the papers at the time. That is beyond any doubt. I would feel some injustice if it wasn't accepted. Mr Green then asked, so you want to have been phone hacked? Prince Harry replied, no one wants to have been phone hacked.
He accuses the publisher of the Daily Mirror, the Sunday Mirror and the Sunday People of phone hacking, getting information by deception and using private investigators for unlawful activities. He said this article about his split from Chelsea Davy was hurtful, describing an invoice for a private investigator titled Project Harry as incredibly disturbing. And when discussing this article about him going to a lap dancing club and Chelsea Davy reportedly screaming at him for half an hour on the phone, he told the court it was bizarre and suspicious that Mirror Group journalists had his girlfriend's phone number, alleging they accessed her phone bills. Now, have you got anything to say? Former editor of the Daily Mirror, Piers Morgan, is not giving evidence in this trial. Here's what he told ITV News today after Prince Harry accused him of listening to Princess Diana's private messages. He's perfectly entitled to his opinions and I will be perfectly entitled to have mine. Prince Harry seemed more confident in the witness box today, but after more than a day and a half of questions, his barrister asked him, what it had been like going through all this with the world's media watching. After a very long pause, looking and sounding emotional, he simply replied, it's a lot. He chose to stay in court to watch one of the journalists he accuses be cross-examined. Jane Kerr was royal correspondent at the Daily Mirror and is bylined in a number of the articles under scrutiny. But she told the court she never phone hacked and never asked anyone to do anything unlawful. The defence say Prince Harry's in the land of total speculation, pointing to a lack of evidence. He insists journalists would have gone to extreme lengths to cover their tracks. He's now done all he can to try and prove that. The trial will last several more weeks. Rebecca Barry, News at 10. The Prime Minister refused to comment today on Prince Harry's claim yesterday that the British government is at rock bottom. Mr Sunak was, he told Anushka this evening, following the long-standing convention of avoiding discussion around specific members of the royal family. His two-day visit to Washington will conclude tomorrow with his fourth meeting with President Biden in as many months. The issues at stake likely to include Ukraine and the regulation of artificial intelligence. Rishi Sunak started his visit to Washington DC at Arlington National Cemetery, visiting an iconic tomb to an unknown soldier killed during World War I. Right. When he meets President Biden in the White House tomorrow, another war will dominate. But is Russia responsible for the destruction of Ukraine's Kharkov Dam? Well, we don't know definitively the source of the attack. Our military and security services and military services are working through that, so I can't preempt the results of that. But look, R Russia throughout this war has used as a deliberate act of strategy to target civilian infrastructure. We've seen that. It's been an active strategy on their part. It's caused enormous suffering to the Ukrainian people, and it is wrong. It's barbaric and it's appalling. So it looks like it was Russia? No, we can't, I can't say that definitively yet. Uh, you know, our, our security and military services are working through it but it you know if if true if it does prove to be intentional it will represent a new low let's talk about artificial intelligence the very people who create this stuff have said even they can't control it they've got warnings of it flooding our internet with propaganda you know automating everyone's jobs maybe even yours maybe even replacing us as humans does that terrify you I think that people have rightly heard these messages and they are concerned and that's why I brought together the leading CEOs of the artificial intelligence companies a few weeks ago in Downing Street to talk about these issues. Would you be comfortable with a robot looking after your grandmother or teaching your children? Yeah, I think, look, I, technology throughout time has improved our lives and will continue to do so. Our job uh, in government is to make sure that we can get those benefits, but make sure that at the same time we're protecting ourselves against the clear risks that the technology poses. Do you agree with Prince Harry that your government has hit rock bottom? I think there's been a long-standing convention that British Prime Ministers don't comment on matters to do with the royal family, as I'm you not, know. And I, I'm not I asking you to comment on a member of the royal family. I'm asking you to comment on your government. Well, I'm, I'm happy to say what my government is doing. I set out at the beginning of this year five priorities for the British people to halve inflation, so, grow the economy, reduce debt, cut waiting lists and to stop the boats. Uh, I think we're making progress against all of those priorities. Donald Trump complimented you. He said you work hard and you do a good job. Why aren't you beating him on this trip? 
because what I am doing is meeting congressional leaders this afternoon from both parties to talk about the relationship between our two countries. And that is where he headed off to, Capitol Hill. Well, it's a great pleasure to be here. Thank you so much for having me. Where he Thank met leaders of both parties in the Senate, Chuck Schumer and Mitch McConnell, as well as the House Speaker, Kevin McCarthy. But the main event comes tomorrow in the White House. And we can talk to Anushka now. And Anushka, time was when a PM arrived in Washington. The first question I'd be putting to you is whether they'd be discussing a trade deal, but it's not even on the agenda now, is it? Yeah, that's right, because remember, it was the big promise of the Leave campaign in 2016 when Donald Trump was president. He promised us not just a free trade deal, but a massive free trade deal. But as you say, Julie, not even on the table. I asked Rishi Sunak, the prime minister, about this on the plane on the way here last night. And he said, look, as long as I've been prime minister, this has not been a priority for both sides. He said that doesn't mean that the economic partnership isn't important. We already trade, uh, you know, an amount worth hundreds of billions of dollars. And he wants to work on economic security against things like Russia driving up energy prices, for example. But nevertheless, this has left some people wanting to say, I told you so. You know, I remember sitting in a press conference in 2016 in Downing Street when Barack Obama told us that if we Brexited, we would be at the back of the queue for a trade deal. Well, at the time, George Osborne was the Chancellor and a big Remainer, and he has just tweeted, it almost looks like we're at the back of the queue when it comes to a Brexit trade deal. Okay, Anushka, thank you very much indeed for that. And there will be more from Anushka's interview with the Prime Minister on Peston's programme. That's after the news, where you are. That's at 10.45 on ITV1 and 5 past 11 on STV. That is Peston. Coming up later. Now, almost since its first edition in the 1850s, the Telegraph newspaper has printed, printed each day with the motto, was, is and will be. What it won't be anymore is owned by the billionaire Barclay family. The entire business, which also includes the Spectator magazine, having been put up for sale after a row with its lenders. And Joel is here. And Joel, a pretty significant opportunity for somebody ahead of an election. It's quite a 12 months ahead. Who are the runners and riders? Uh, well, Lloyds Bank will be hoping there'll be plenty of interest. The whole point of the the reason the telegraph's up for sale, Julie, is basically the Barclay family. Billionaires they are, though they are O. Lloyd's Bank, close to just shy of a billion pounds. The loan was defaulted on, it was secured against the business, so Lloyd's have basically seized control and now roll up, roll up. Uh, they're trying to hold, get as much money back as they can. On one level, this is an extraordinary story because it's about the rapid collapse of the Barclay family's media empire. But inevitably, as you say, an election looms, and these titles, let's be clear, have basically formed and shaped political debate on the right wing in the UK for a long, long, long period of time. Back in 2004, that's when the Barclay brothers, Frederick and David, paid £665 million for the Telegraph Group. With it came the Daily Telegraph, the Sunday Telegraph and the Spectator titles. Note, the Barclay brothers outbid the Daily Mail at the time. At the time, the circulation of the Daily Mail was also pretty impressive. 868,000 copies every day. Newspaper sales, of course, have collapsed since. Readers have been moving online. But even today, The Telegraph was one of the early newspapers to put up a paywall. Today, they've got 586,000 subscribers. That's not too shabby, particularly when you compare it, as we can see here, to some of the other uh, big titles in the UK, shy of The Guardian and the FT, but, you know, they're slightly ahead of the times there. So the business is profitable. It continues to have status and influence. Who are the runners and riders? Well, there's lots of campfire gossip. <laughs> Jeff Bezos, uh, the founder of Amazon, rumoured to be interested a few years ago. Will he come back? The Daily Mail may return. Uh, the Reach Group, which owns the Mirror, the Star and the Express, may well also be interested. Bear in mind, though, any future sale may attract the regulator on competition grounds. It may also prompt the government to intervene. Bear in mind, the Secretary of State at the Department of Culture, Media and Sport can intervene where she thinks there may be a public interest concern. Fascinating. OK, Joel, thank you very much indeed for that. Thank you. Pope Francis is tonight recovering in a Rome hospital after successful surgery on his abdominal wall this afternoon. Shortly after his weekly audience this morning, the 86-year-old was put under general anaesthetic for the three-hour hernia operation. The Vatican says it was completed without any complications and afterwards the Pope was said to have been alert, in good spirits and even making a joke with his surgeon. 
Now that has been in the skies above much of North America in recent days, something hanging thick in the air, a smoky haze from wildfires burning in Canada, has been carried with the wind hundreds of miles south. It's engulfed some of the continent's most famous skylines. But behind these incredible images lies a dangerous reality. The pollution is so severe, it's triggered air quality alerts and even brought on breathing difficulties for some, today halting a Jodie Comer play on Broadway. There was an ethereal pink hue surrounding New York's world-famous skyline today. Smoke from forest fires in Canada wreathing its high-rises, so some almost disappeared into the murk. This is an unprecedented event in our city, and New Yorkers must take precaution. We recommend vulnerable New Yorkers stay inside. And all New Yorkers should limit outdoor activity to the greatest extent possible. In Ohio, the pollution had cast the morning sun an apocalyptic shade of red amid stark warnings about the effects on people's health. Um, everything east of Columbus, Ohio is experiencing levels on the order of uh, 150 to 180, um, which is an air quality index, uh, suggesting that these are very hazardous levels to be breathing. In Michigan, the smog was so thick planes could barely see to take off, all caused by forest fires in Canada, which have been raging for weeks. And now, blazes in New Jersey are adding to the problems. In Maryland, many shoppers weren't taking any chances. Oh, I am wearing it today because of what I feel that's going on. And I mean, if you look at the cars and you see, it's almost like grit on the windshields and everything. So you can imagine if it's sticking there, what it's doing to the respiratory system. So it's, it's, it's frightening. Although these wildfires are hundreds of miles away, the effects are being felt across the eastern United States. Here in Maryland, school children are being warned not to play outside because of concerns for their health. In the nation's capital, the view might have been opaque, but the warning was clear. And we cannot ignore that climate change continues to make these disasters worse. None of this, none of this is coincidence. This smoke and fog over New York and the rest of the Northeast is a warning from nature. The lack of rain and snow this winter has left forests vulnerable. The worst effects of climate change appear to be happening far faster than anyone feared. Dam Rivers, News at 10, Maryland. Those hoping to get away from it all this summer have been dealt another blow as security guards at Heathrow Airport announced new strike dates in their ongoing dispute on pay. More than 2,000 members of the Unite Union will walk out for 31 days starting on the 24th of this month and including seven consecutive weekends in July and August. Now for health bosses tasked with tackling nightmare waiting lists in the NHS, the search for bold and innovative ideas could hardly be more urgent. Now it's hoped the wider use of robots could form part of the solution. The number of people awaiting treatment currently stands at 7.3 million in England, and that's a record high. And while the number of robotic procedures has increased from just under 25,000 four years ago to nearly 36,000 last year, experts say that is still only a fraction of those who could benefit from the latest advances in medical technology. The middle one is the camera, and then the, the left and the right one would be a, a pair of scissors. Guy's and St Thomas's in London carry out more robotic surgeries than any other hospital trust in England. But it's not as big as it looks on that scan. ITV News was given exclusive access to see their latest robot operate on a kidney for the first time. While surgeon Ben set to work, I went to see the machine away from the sterile wrappings of the operating theatre. This is our surgical robot, Hugo, and today's patient is a red pepper. So can you show me how it works? Of course, I'll need to put on my glasses so that I can see everything in 3D. It's very much like um, using your wrists, but inside the body. I can be very deliberate with my actions um, and hopefully preserve as much of the healthy tissue as possible. But it, it, it is you in control, not the robot. It's the surgeon that's in control of, of all of the actions. So this isn't AI surgery? Not yet. 
At £1.5 million, Hugo is cheaper than the systems which are already in use. So can I take it for a spin, Dan? 100%. Just first try grasping a seed, one close by. The 3D is so good, isn't it, in terms of being able to get the depth perception? Uh, there might be, there might be Back in theatre as Ben closes up, Hugo is doing some work of its own, sharing video around the world to help teaching and using artificial intelligence to learn about and label the material. The first step of actually starting to have a robot that will help you is that the robot needs to know where it is and what it's doing. And this is the first step of it actually showing you where it is in the operation. Kidney removed, Hugo and Ben's work is done. Says you went really well. It's extremely uh, good robot, very, very good vision, um, very dexterous. I think it's got a big impact potentially for the wider NHS. Not many people are using robotics. And because this system is easy to pick up and cheaper than the standard system that is existing already, there is much greater potential to roll that out. As the waiting lists increase, unless we have more access to this kind of instrumentation, we can't do our job. If we have the same capacity as we did before the pandemic, we are just going to fail. The kidney patient we filmed is doing well. Surgeons say the speed of recovery will save bed space, time and, importantly, money. It's up to NHS management to decide whether that saving justifies funding the rise of the robots. Martin Stew, News at 10. Extraordinary stuff now. Football and West Ham's 43-year search for a trophy is over as they've been crowned Europa Conference champions after a 2-1 win of Italian side Fiorentina in Prague. The match was briefly held up in the first half when Fiorentina's Cristiano Biraghi was struck in the head by empty cups allegedly thrown from the stands by West Ham supporters. West Ham eventually scored the winner in the final minute of normal time. Jared Bowen struck home to bring a European trophy back to East London, the club's first major trophy since the 1980 FA Cup. Finally, sodden and dirty, the historic significance of a lump of timber discovered in Berkshire could have easily been overlooked, but after pulling it from the ground, hosing it down, the landowner soon discovered he had on his hands what's thought to be the oldest wood carving in Britain, older than the Romans, older even than Stonehenge, and perfectly preserved thanks to the peat it was found in. Okay. It might not look much, but this wood carving is 6,000 years old. Experts at Historic England are conserving the Mesolithic period find, which bears our ancestors' marks. So here we can see the, the notches that have been carved in the wood. We've got about 10 in all, so there's kind of one faint one here, we've got one here. It's the oldest piece of decoratively carved wood ever found in Britain. It does really open a window to the past. It lets us think about Mesolithic people in different ways. In this timeless part of the Berkshire landscape, this ancient timber has been hidden beneath an ever-changing world above. Derek Fawcett was overseeing construction on a new workshop at his home when a contractor discovered the extraordinary find digging the foundations. So I washed it off with the hose, it became quite apparent there were some very strange markings on it. Oh, I'm amazed. <laughs> because, you know, the sort of wood you could easily toss on the bonfire. Actually, it would burn for a very long time. And I think by the grace of God, I didn't do that. Radiocarbon tests date the wood at more than 4,500 years BC. That's almost 6,000 years older than Henry VIII's famous ship, the Mary Rose, one of the largest wooden structures rescued to date. It was also carved more than 4,500 years before the Romans invaded Britain and is even 2,000 years older than Stonehenge. Oh, it's very humbling. It um, yeah, makes you really reflect on, you know, on your place in life or on the earth and um, to hold something so old um, to work with it. It's like a real connection to the past. Back at the timber's former resting place, I asked Derek if he wonders what other ancient treasures could lie beneath. I do, but you ain't going to find out. <laughs> Neil Connery, News at 10, Boxford.
Berkshire. I think that is it. We'll see you tomorrow. Good night.